I am Lyle, and uh, I'm, I'm bringing you the word today for Tim. Give him rest. He's, he's been doing it all night, all week. Uh, and then uh, they had a, a long day yesterday. I think it was, what, 6.30 to 3.30, building here in the heat. So uh, a well-deserved time off. Not that he actually got it because he had to do worship, too, but, you know. Uh, give them a hand, too. Is that not excellent worship? I don't know about you, but... So we're, we're picking up today where, where Tim left off last week, and we're in Matthew, we're now in chapter 9, verses 1 through 17, we're going to cover today. That's a good bit of, uh, of scripture to coverage. It's actually, when I first started looking at it, when Tim gave me this set of verses, uh, I thought, that's really like three Sundays worth of messages, but we're going to get through there. I'll tell you that uh, when I was in seminary, my, one of my mentors told me that the key to a good message is to have a strong opening a strong closing, and then keep the two of them as close together as possible. So I don't promise to do that, but that's what brings a good one. So Um, so we're picking up in verse 1, and and as Ben read it, we see that after being rejected on the other side, if you remember last week where where Tim left off, that they had uh, sent Jesus away after he cast out the demons, and they went into the pigs, which was their livelihood, and then they ran off the cliff, basically. So it says here in verse 1, So he got in a boat and crossed over and came to his own town. So the people of Gadarenes had had clearly indicated that they didn't want Jesus there in their town anymore. And Jesus doesn't linger where he's not wanted. Um, I I can tell you that there are people who have rejected him, rejected him, rejected him. And you can see the absence of him in their life. So he now returns to his own town, Capernaum. And then we see in verse 2... He comes upon a, uh, a paralytic, a- and he, at this point, is intentionally stressing his power. He's displaying his power to forgive sin. It says, just then some men brought him a paralytic lying on a stretcher. Seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, have courage, son, your sins are forgiven. And Mark and Luke explained that, that they actually had to climb on the roof, tear a hole in the roof, and then lo- his friends did, and then lower the paralytic down in front of Jesus because the crowds were so great that they couldn't get him to Jesus to be healed. So Jesus sees their faith in their determination to, to beat these obstacles in order to get their friend to him, and he sees his faith in going through this process. But his first words to the paralytic are, have courage, son. You see, Jesus first ministered to the paralytic's mental condition. He came there to be healed of paralysis, but the first thing Jesus says is, cheer up. Something good's about to happen. Now, if he's telling him to have courage, he may be thinking something's good about to happen because he's going to be cured of paralysis, but Jesus had something else in mind. And, and oftentimes, at our lowest times, We have this negative outlook on life, and Jesus would encourage us if we would just listen. This man's body was paralyzed, but so was his soul, because he didn't yet know Jesus as his Savior. His spiritual state was Jesus' first and primary concern. So Jesus spoke these incredible words in the present tense, not in the future tense. He says, your sins are forgiven. It's interesting that that the paralytic didn't ask to have his sins forgiven. He just came for healing from Jesus, and he got so much more. So it was a pretty bold statement to say your sins are forgiven because that's a power, that's a right that belongs to God and God alone. And so everyone's shocked by this. And so far too often, when we concentrate on the, the powerful giving and the healing and the blessings of Jesus, we forget that first and foremost, he's a savior. He has the power to forgive the spiritual sickness and give eternal life, but we tend to focus on the temporal. And, you know, in God, it, it, so if God doesn't heal us or someone we love or doesn't provide that bump and pay you need or pay that bill for you or eliminate that concern in your life, just know that that isn't his primary concern and he doesn't want it to be yours either. 
There's people around that would have declared the healing of this man's paralysis is the greatest possible miracle in his life. But Christ wanted to go deeper. He wanted to get to his soul. And so Jesus' declaration of forgiveness now in verses 3 through 7 starts to bring out the charge of blasphemy from the scribes, from the Pharisees that were there. And so by claiming this right to forgive sin, Jesus was claiming a privilege that belonged to God and God alone. He knew that. Jesus in this set of passages beginning to reveal who he is and what the plan is moving forward. But these Pharisees who had been following him around, they'd seen miracle after miracle. This is not the first miracle Jesus had performed. He had just cast out demons. But they couldn't come to that logical conclusion, that fork in the road that you and I can see in retrospect that where his power came from and, and who he was. So they're saying either Jesus has the right to forgive because he's God or he blasphemes because he unjustly claims the attributes and privileges and prerogatives that belong to God and God alone. So obviously in verse 4, the scholars have refused to reach that conclusion, that possibility, as it says, perceiving their thoughts, Jesus said, why are you thinking evil things in your heart? You see, just as Jesus had read the, the mental state of the paralytic, he also read the minds of the Pharisees. He knows it wasn't actually jealousy for God's honor that they charged him with blasphemy, or they were internally anyway, but it was ill will for Jesus because they considered him dangerous to their authority, to their position. If he was who he was claiming to be, it would destroy everything that they were in their eyes. You see, they were acting out of fear, not out of faith. We see this man and his friends acting out of extreme faith to lower him through the roof to be healed of paralysis, something that's impossible without God's power. But they're acting out of fear. They're concerned he might actually have power. So his question, what are you, why are you thinking evil in your hearts, shows that he's evaluating their motives. And it seems that they were thinking that Jesus vainly now had proclaimed forgiveness of sins because he was unable to, to create healing in this man's life, to heal the broken body of the paralytic. But then Jesus parallels the impossibility of healing paralysis in verse five to an even greater impossibility, which was the forgiveness of sins. He says, for which is easier? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk? Now it was a rhetorical question to challenge their thinking and their reasoning. He makes the point that he was displaying supernatural power consistent with the expected Messiah that they claimed to have been looking for, who would not only heal physical infirmities, but spiritual disease as well. Anyone can say your sins are forgiven and there's no way to prove whether they are or not, right? I don't have that right, but let's say I claim to be the second coming and I'm forgiving your sins. I have no right to do so, but you can't prove that I didn't. Right? So Jesus says, but rise, take up your bed and go home. Now that could be verified. That's something they could just watch and see. Does this happen? Did he get up? Did he pick up his bed and did he walk? Well, yes, he did. So his words, even after watching him heal multiple healings throughout and miracles, amazing miracles that were drawing these large crowds, they weren't sufficient to convince these skeptics. They had no faith. And so if Jesus had blasphemed, how could he possibly perform a miracle? In John uh, uh, chapter 9, verse 31, it says, We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he listens to him. That was the blind man that had been healed, saying this power has to come from God. Well, Jesus didn't make him wait long for the verification. In verse 6, he says, But so that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He, then he told the paralytic, Get up, take your stretcher, and go home. So all three actions, rising, lifting, picking up it, and walking away, were impossible previously for this paralytic. So this is a pretty convincing argument that there's some power here, right? But listen to the people's reaction to the greater miracle it says, so he went up and got home. And in verse 8, shows the typical reaction at that time when Jesus would do a miracle in somebody's life. 
It says, when the crowd saw this, they were awestruck and gave glory to God who had given such authority to men. So the crowd's reaction was to praise God for the healing, rightly so. Where else could that power come from? And there was no mistake that Jesus' authority to create this healing had come from God. But listen, they praised God that he had given such authority to men. To men. That indicates that they thought that Jesus was just another prophet who had been given some power through God, temporary. In the Old Testament, you see prophets given Holy Spirit power and then have it taken away. Given power to perform a miracle and then have it taken away. That's who they're thinking Jesus is now because they're saying God has given such authority to men. They're not yet seeing him as God, the Son of Man, the Son of God. They hadn't yet conceded that the Messiah, the very Son of God, who as God had the power to forgive sin, was the same one healing this body. So why is it that we're more impressed with healing miracles of the physical than the miracle of forgiveness? You see crowds lining up to pay $25 for healings at 7 and 10. But when you ask them to repent of their sins and give their lives to the Lord... They're somewhere else. You see, <clears throat> people still seek and applaud his miracles, but refuse to heed what the miracles prove. He performed miracles to prove his love and his divine power, that they were sufficient for our greatest need, which is the need of forgiveness and internal cleansing, a spiritual cleansing. And far too many still continue to seek and applaud him for the physical, for financial blessings, which, let's face it, the, the, the cost of the forgiveness and the value of the forgiveness of sin is both much greater than the value and cost in any physical healing. In verses 9 through 13, we see him call uh, Matthew, the tax collector, to, to follow him. And, and it's, a, it's a call to follow with courage, It says, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Now that sounds really simple. We see his disciples continuously, immediately answering the call to follow. And we don't really think about what that means. What was the cost to follow? Because there was a cost to Matthew. There were also some benefits, which I don't think he yet realized but he was willing to pay the price. He was willing to suffer the loss and the cost to follow Jesus without even knowing the full benefit. So uh, Bible commentator William Barclay said this, he lost a comfortable job, but he found a destiny. He lost a good income, but he found honor. He lost a comfortable security, but he found an adventure the like of which he had never dreamed. It may be, that if we accept the challenge of Christ, we shall find ourselves poorer in material things. It may be that the worldly ambitions will have to go, but beyond doubt, we will find peace and a joy and a thrill in life that we never knew before. In Christ, a man finds a wealth beyond anything that he can have to abandon for the sake of Christ. So I know... A lot of us will say that, we're, yeah, I'll give it all up for Jesus. Well, I, I have said that many times, and I still struggle with it. I still uh, question some of my choices to give up and follow him. Uh, Jesus and I have a regular discussion and wrestling match about uh, my decision to take lower-paying jobs to be able to do more ministry. And I'm thinking, well, maybe we need to look at this again when the bills are due, right? You know, uh, I, I question those things, the, the, what I've given up sometimes, because there's still real needs in our life. Matthew gave up a good income and just trusted that somehow he would still eat. I don't know. I'm going to guess that somewhere along the line, Matthew, here and there, when things got sparse, might have thought, I could go back to tax collecting real quick and get us some more money, you know. But even if we acknowledge that our life will be blessed if we do so, how many of us are actually willing to do what the Lord asks of us? And I believe he wants us to consider if, if we are currently practicing what we preach and the way we walk and the way we behave, the way we talk to other people, the way we conduct business. I think he says, do you truly follow me 
or do you just say that you'll follow me? And then Jesus provided an example in verses 10 and 11. Uh, it, was, it was an example of the, how he wants us to live and interact with others. It says, while he was reclining at the table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came to eat with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And so here Jesus is giving himself and his actions as an example of what it means to do and follow the Father's will. The Pharisees had been following him around and watching everything he did very closely, and he knew that. So his actions were quite intentional. I don't think that much of what Jesus did was incidental. Uh, I, I wish we had a more complete record because I'm sure there's so much more intricacy and detail to his planned actions. And here, he knew they were watching what he was doing. He knew what they would say about him eating with tax collectors and sinners. He knew what they were seeing. And he, so they had, you have to understand that these Pharisees took pride in, in keeping religious traditions and these religious rituals of purity. Um, and, and they believed that was how they worked out their salvation. They had daily cleansing rituals that they thought made them clean. You remember in, in another place in the scripture where Jesus calls them whitewashed tombs. They looked good. They were clean on the outside, but not on the inside. But they believed that these Outward things were what were going to get them where they wanted to be. They also felt that anyone who didn't act like them couldn't come into God's presence. That was how Pharisees were able to communicate with God in their eyes, was because of these rituals, these outward cleansing things that they did, this keeping pure in the world's eyes. So the, the Pharisees viewed tax collectors as the complete scum of the earth because they betrayed the Jewish people in order to collect money for the Roman oppressors. There really weren't too many people that were lower in their estimation than these tax collectors. So when Matthew gave it all up to follow Jesus, that didn't really phase him so much. It, it's sort of like you know, saying, I'm going to stop selling dope on the corner and you know, go do something else. It's a it's good idea, um, but not an overly impressive example to follow for them, right? To the Pharisees, he was ceremonially unclean and wasn't even worth associating with, much less recognizing anything he had given up. And so they believed that he was destined for hell because he wasn't like them, because he didn't do like they did. I got to tell you, the first church I ever went to kicked me out because I didn't look like them. The second church told me I wasn't welcome there, and the third church as well. I don't look like I used to look. I, I had really, this is early 70s, so the world has changed. But I had really long hair, and I didn't know church. I didn't grow up in the church world, and I showed up in tattered jeans and a tie-dye, and they didn't want me there. I didn't look right. I didn't look outwardly like someone that they wanted to associate with. And I got to tell you, when I finally got a hold of a Bible and read it, what I learned, what I got out of that was, these people in church don't know Jesus. Well, that's a lot of what we're dealing with right here. They didn't know God's heart. No matter how much they had read and shared the word of God, it never penetrated their heart. So Jesus is trying to teach them a lesson by his own actions. That outward appearance doesn't determine a person's heart or their relationship with God. Matthew was indeed a sinner. And so were the Pharisees. Right? The Pharisees looked holy. But they were only trying to gain political position and notoriety. They, they wanted to be recognized in the, in the eyes of the people. This elevated them in stature and finances and position and authority on earth. Matthew admitted who he was. He admitted that he was wrong. And he abandoned that world in order to follow Jesus. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were deceitful about who they were inside. And tried to put on a front. But God, unlike the Pharisees, doesn't judge our life according to the standards of men or what we see outside. In 1 Samuel, in chapter 16, verse 7, it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or his stature, because I have rejected him. Humans do not see what the Lord sees. For humans see what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. See, Jesus calls us to forsake the world 
in order to follow him. That takes faith and that takes courage. Particularly today, there was a time where saying that you were a follower of Jesus was kind of almost expected. In today's world, that'll catch you some flack. But if your faith remains strong, you can walk in courage and continue to follow him. What people think of us doesn't really matter. It's what God thinks that's important. There's the old saying, we must be willing to abandon it all for the sake of the call. Uh, I think that's what Jesus is showing here, is that what you're abandoning, quite frankly, isn't anything compared to what you're getting. You know, the comparison of what Matthew lost versus what he gained. So in verses 12 through 13, Jesus challenges the Pharisees. It says, now when he heard this, he said, it is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. So that right there, Jesus is actually quoting a scripture they knew. It was from Hosea 6.6. 6. And the full verse in Hosea says, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. All these outward things didn't matter if there wasn't something happening good in their heart. So he was pointing out the Pharisees' lack of godly character by telling that they were the ones who actually needed a physician. A lot of people read this and think Jesus say, I'm here for these tax collectors and sinners I'm meeting with because they're sick. You don't need a doctor because you're well. It's not what he was saying. He was showing them how unwell they were, just how sick they were despite their rituals and practices. So some people think that the gossip, the concept that he was sharing in, in Hosea was, was new. People think, oh, Jesus came and you know, said these things and he's changing what happened, but it's not. I'm going to give you quite a few verses here real quick to run through with this same basic sentiment, Old and New Testament. Psalm 40, verse 6 says, You do not delight in sacrifice and offering. You open my ears to listen. You do not ask for a whole burnt offering or a sin offering. Proverbs 21, verse 3 do what is righteous and to doing what is righteous and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Hebrews 13, 16. Don't neglect to do what is good and to share, for God is pleased with such sacrifices. James 1, 27, this is sort of the guiding verse for our ministry in Haiti. And it says, pure and undefiled religion before God, the Father, is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. A lot of people want to leave off that last one and say, oh, we just got to go help orphans and widows. That's good stuff. There should be some action behind your heart change. But don't forget the last part, to keep oneself unstained from the world. How do you do that? I can't. He can. And so I can't cleanse myself. I can't keep myself unstained. That's what he did for me. So going back to Jesus' reference to Hosea 6.6, 6, in ancient Israel, the people had a problem. They would worship foreign gods. Uh, they would commit a bunch of sins on a regular basis. They would live a lifestyle away from God. And then they'd come to the temple for worship, acting like nothing was wrong. Uh, many of the Israelites were, were hypocrites, and the Lord's saying, this angers me. He told them he didn't want to smell the aroma of their sacrifices. He wasn't going to accept their worship until they sought first the knowledge of God. Listen to what he says in uh, Amos, chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. I hate, I despise your feast. I can't stand the stench of your solemn assemblies. Even if you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will have no regard for your fellowship offerings of fattened cattle. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice flow like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. What is he saying there? He's saying love God and love others. Does that sound familiar? It's not a new thing. It's what God has been telling the people for a long time. He gave them rituals to help them see their need for him and to help change the need for a change in their heart and as a way of pointing forward to the ultimate sacrifice of Christ on the cross. They weren't to be in lieu of 
knowledge of him and change of life. And we sometimes tend to think that by attending church that our, and worshiping the Lord that we're, we're meeting the mark by reading the Bible and praying. And these are all good things, all things he does call us to do, but they aren't the thing, right? Paul said, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. So forsaking the world and following Jesus is the only sacrifice that is absolutely pleasing to him. Other things come along with that. When he has changed your heart, when you are following him, you will do things. You know, James says, faith without works is dead. He's not saying your works prove anything other than your love for God. You got to have the love first. You got to show mercy first. You got to love his justice first. And then your life will change. So, like Israel, if we come to church and profess to know that we have to abandon our life to kingdom service, but we don't really do it or haven't acknowledged who he is, uh, then God's not really accepting that worship from us either. In Ezekiel 33, 31, it says, they come to you as my people do. They sit before you as my people and they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with the mouth... They show much love, but with their hearts, they pursue their own gain. And I think that's what gets in the way. Remember I said earlier, sometimes I I wrestle with God over some of the the worldly things that I say I've given up, but I also realize there's some need for. I don't always rely on him to provide it. I, I sometimes wrestle with how I get those things. Lord, should I switch jobs? Lord, do I need to work another job? No. Do I need to trust you? Yes. So... I hope that we don't fall into that trap that if we can't show mercy, then we shouldn't expect him to accept our sacrifices or show mercy to us. He says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So then he moves into verses 14 through 17. And he says, uh, remember, he's already forgiven a paralytic of his sins, which made the religious snobs angry. And then we see him eating with tax collectors which makes the religious snobs angry. And then in this last one, he points to their criticism, which comes through the disciples of John. It says, then John and his disciples came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but you, your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests be sad while the groom is with them? The time will come when the groom will be taken away from them, then they will fast. No one patches an old garment with unshrunk cloth because the patch pulls away from the garment and makes the tear worse. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the skins burst, the wine spills out, and the skins are ruined. No, they put new wine into fresh wine skins and both are preserved. So you gotta understand they came in there, including John's disciples, who who, they knew that Judaism was off track. And they thought that maybe Jesus was there to help them reform themselves and to reform Judaism. He wasn't there to reform it. He was there to transform it. He wasn't out to give old form, new life, but to give life to a new form, a new way to God, a new understanding of who he was. Yes, Jesus did fast and pray often, but it wasn't a ritual designed for others to see. It wasn't an outward appearance thing. In the Old Testament, there's actually one day that the Jews were commanded to fast, and that's on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. But the Pharisees took this, like they did many things, and they twisted it to put on some sort of spiritual discipline that it was meant to be, and made it into some super self-righteous act that they could do to look good. You see, you can't live under law and under grace at the same time. The Bible says, for the law was given through Moses, Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Living under the law is a burden. Living under grace liberates you. If you don't have joy of the Lord and the freedom that he gives you through that grace, I'd love to talk to you some more. There is so much freedom in giving up the things of the world. You get so much more. And Jesus here, by identifying himself as the bridegroom and his disciples as as the wedding guest, is a foreshadowing of what he's talking about, of bringing the church to him and, and the, 
being taken away as a foreshadowing of his death that was necessary for us to have forgiveness of sins. The Bible says, though you have not seen him, you love him. This is 1 Peter 1.8. You believe in him and you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. I don't know about you, but that's pretty exciting. I, I kind of like joy. I think it's better than depression. I don't know. That's me. So he, he was predicting his death. Matter of fact, when it says taken, that the bridegroom would be taken, the literal translation would be ripped away violently, which is exactly what happened. Jesus was saying that after his burial, after his death, his followers would fast, but not like the Pharisees fasted. They would do it from their heart and in private. You see, all three of these ending stories, these little mini parables that he gives us at the end are about one thing, and that's replacing the old with the new. Replacing old ritualistic works-based religion with true faith. Replacing outward cleanliness with an inward transformation, a cleanliness of the heart. Replacing that public spectacle of fasting with a private matter between an individual and God. Replacing duty with love and mercy. In today's scripture, we followed a path of faith. We moved from healing the broken with his sins and his body to calling us to follow with courage like Matthew did, and into embracing the newness of Christ. And our faith journey is one of continuous growth and transformation. It, it never ends, and that's the beauty, is he continues to work on us, he continues to walk alongside us, he continues to be there for us. So we can live out our faith with boldness and courage. Trusting in the power of God to do miracles in and through us. See, Jesus wants to acknowledge where we have failed to love justice and mercy. Um, don't go to Facebook for this information, right? What you'll find is fights and disagreements. Jesus wants us to love, to ask for his forgiveness and to experience a true change of heart. He wants us to have the faith and courage to really follow him and experience that joy. So you have an opportunity now. We're gonna have a time of prayer during this song of worship. And do it out of, not duty, but out of love. If you want to come up and receive some prayer, you want to surrender something to him, you want to ask his forgiveness, maybe you've never asked him into your life. Maybe you don't already have a working relationship with Christ our Savior. I want to give you a chance to surrender to him today. Let's pray something like this and just say, Lord, I know that I haven't been on the right path. I know, Lord, that I've strayed from you that I'm not where I need to be, that I've put on a show, that outwardly I may make it look good at times, but inside, Lord, I'm lost. And I need your forgiveness, the forgiveness that comes only through your death and resurrection, that you, the perfect one, paid the price for me. And Lord, now I accept that gift that I may walk with you and have the joy that comes only from you that I'm willing to walk away from the things of the world and walk with you instead, Lord. And we thank you in Jesus' name.